So why does the Maldives need a national sea turtle monitoring program if these laws are already in place? Uh, well, the law will expire next year. It's up for renewal. And in addition to the law on paper, the Maldives needs a management plan. So a plan on how to conserve the turtles that are here and how to increase the, their numbers, how to protect the future of sea turtles because they are important to the ecosystem and also to the economy. So to do this, to make a management plan, we need a realistic estimate of how many turtles there are and where they are in the country to create an effective strategy to manage them. So what we've been doing at CMARC is trying to create a photo monitoring program to look at the numbers of turtles that we normally visit on our guest excursions. So we started this in 2011, and it's based on a method developed uh, by a group in Reunion Island. And uh, if any of you were at the manta ray seminar, you know you can identify manta rays by the spots on its belly. Well, turtles have an identifying feature, and that's the scales on the side of its face. So each one is unique, like our fingerprints. They can be recognized as individuals. Photo identification is becoming a very common method used by biologists all around the world for many different animals. So many animals have unique biological markers. So the manta rays have spots. The whale sharks have the, the, the spots on the flanks. Uh, tigers and zebras have unique patterns of stripes, and even large whales have unique patterns on the underside of their tail. So photo monitoring is being used for all of these different animals to look at population numbers and uh, uh, distribution. And it's very good method for studying endangered species or vulnerable species because it's non-invasive, which means you don't disturb the animal. You don't have to touch it or catch it. You simply have to take a photo of it. So the turtle may not even know that you're there or the other animal. So this is called a non-invasive study. And additionally, it doesn't require any special training. So anyone can take a photo of a, of a turtle. So people without special scientific training that contribute data are known as citizen scientists. The goals of the photo ID project for turtles are to create a database to assess the population size and distribution of each type of turtle in the Maldives, to better understand how they're using different reefs, and to study their seasonal migration patterns. So how to photograph a turtle? It's quite easy. You do your best not to scare or disturb the turtle, so it's best to be a few meters away and approach from the side, so not directly on, uh, in front, and not directly behind the turtle, because that usually is confrontational. It may scare the turtle. Again, don't ch touch or chase the turtle when you're trying to photograph it. And it's important to give it space when it's coming to the surface to breathe. Um, when it's coming up, it stays at the surface for a few minutes and then goes back down. And this is the type of picture that we need for identification purposes. So we need both sides of the face because, as you can see, the left and right side are not the same. They're different. Um, so we need the combination of the left and the right and also a shot of the shell, or the carapace on the back, because it may have some identifying marks on it. So some good photos should be square on the turtle, a clear photo, and fairly close with a high-resolution camera. If the photo is blurry or part of the turtle's face is hidden, then it's very difficult to use that for identification purposes. And again, the most common species we're seeing in the identification database are the hawksbill and the green. So if you take a photo, you want to know what type of turtle it is. The bigger turtles with the rounder heads are the green turtles, and they generally have more scales on the side of their faces. The hawksbills we see are usually smaller than the greens. They have the pointy, beak-like jaw, um, and they have fewer scales on the side of the face. So to identify a turtle, we use the scales, their shape and their position, to create a type of code. So you can do this visually as well. You don't need to use a code. If you just have a pictures of a few turtles, you can look visually and compare them to see if they are the same or if they're different. But once you get to have a few tens or hundreds or thousands of turtles in your database, you need a way to quickly identify the small differences between them. 
So each scale gets a three-digit code based on its position and its shape. So the first scale in the first row is scale 1, 1, 5. The second scale in the first row is scale 1, 2, 5, and so on. So the first scale, the first rows are touching the eye, the second row is touching the first row, and the third row is touching the second. So we get a string of three-digit numbers. That, that's the unique code for the turtle. We get uh, numbers for the left, numbers for the, for the right. And we have a special program where we can compare the codes for different turtles and look at percentage matching. So if you run the code and you get a 100% match, uh, chances are that's the same turtle. So you can have a look at the pictures and confirm yes or no, that is the same turtle. And depending on the quality of photo and who is identifying it, you may not get 100%, but normally it's pretty close. And so from this, you can get a story about each of the turtles you're seeing. So if you're snorkeling with a guest and they ask you about the turtle you see, it's a little more interesting to say, we saw Hawksbill number one. Her name is Lulu. She's uh, been photographed 28 times between 2010 and 2014. She's a resident of this reef, Ba Finalos. She's an older juvenile, 55 centimeters, and she's a very friendly turtle. So that's a little more exciting for the guests than saying, I think we saw a hawksbill turtle. It makes it a little more real for them, um, a little more personal, um, and they can get a chance to, to get involved. Um, so people generally tend to conserve what they care about and they only care about things that they know about and they're interested in. So this is a way to create awareness, uh, education, not only among tourists, but also among locals. So I'll just go through a bit of the preliminary results. So as I mentioned, we've been running this since late 2011. Um, in at that time, for the first two years, the effort was concentrated in North Malé and Ba, and now we've expanded to more than 200 sites in 14 atolls, cooperating with marine di biologists, uh, dive professionals, and also tourists submitting photos. So to date, there's over a thousand hawksbills in the database, 140 green turtles, and one loggerhead, and we've recorded uh, more than 3,200 sightings of these turtles. Um, the majority of them are in North Malé, Ba, and Ari, because that's where the majority of the resorts are. So, so far, the results have shown that green and hawksbill turtles exhibit extremely high site fidelity, which means they're always seen at the same reef. They don't move from reef to reef, like mantas may migrate from one atoll to another. Turtles very rarely move from site to site. So if you see a turtle on your house reef, you're likely to see a turtle again on that house reef. Most of the turtles we observed were either females or older juveniles, usually around 40 to 50 centimeters. So we don't see a lot of bigger adult turtles and very few males. And we photographed 10 times more hawksbills than greens. So greens are, tend to be a little more shyer when you see them when you're diving. Um, and also hawksbills uh, are more common. In Baatol, we photographed more juveniles. Um, in North Malé, we photographed more males. And unfortunately, the data from Ariatol, very rarely do we get sizes associated with it. So without a size, it's harder to tell if it's an older juvenile or if it's a, a younger adult. And as you can see, there's very few males recorded from any atoll. Um, only 1.8% of the turtles photographed, 1.8% of the hawksbills were male, and only 2.3% of the green turtles were male. So very rare to see a male. They tend to be photographed in deeper water, as you can see from the picture, not on the reef top. And there tends to be fewer males per reef, maybe one or two, um, as opposed to 10 or more females. And they tend to stay for less time, so they may not be residents for that reef, they may come for one or two months, perhaps for the breeding season, and then leave. So I'll just go through the three main atolls, Ba, North Malé, and Ari, and some results from there. So from Ba Atoll, we have 351 turtles photographed from 40 different sites. 
Um, there's a number of participating resorts in Baja Atolls, so we have most of the uh, reefs in Baja covered. There's uh, been turtles photographed from there. The top uh, reef is Finalos, so there's been 41 turtles uh, confirmed, so that means both sides of the face were photographed, um, including one-sided profiles can give you an overinflated number. So if you take a picture of the right side one time and a picture of the left side another time, you may think it's two turtles when it's in fact one. So the numbers in this table show both profiles. Um, Don Fan is the number one reef for sighting green turtles. Um, Finalos and the other reefs are mainly hawksbill turtles. Uh, a special mention in Ba is the island of Finalos. As I mentioned, the, the top, uh, the highest number of uh, turtles identified from Ba. So we have 65, including one sided profiles, and three green turtles. Since mid 2012, the island has been under development for a new resort, uh, soon to open, a Mila Fushi resort. So building resort creates a lot of disturbance on the reef. Sediments are stirred up channels are dug. Uh, in this picture you can see they built the water villas right on top of the reef. So this destroys part of the reef obviously and it destroys part of the turtles habitat. There's less food, less space, which means increased competition. Uh, there's less resources for the same number of turtles. So this used to be a reef we went to all the time. Unfortunately, after development, we went there less and less and less because they have made such a mess of the reef. Um, and many turtles have not been seen since the, the resort um, development started. So they may have moved, but we haven't photographed them on any nearby reef. Uh, they may have also died, although this is probably unlikely. There is an increased amount of competition for space or the development, the increase in boat traffic uh, and people around may have contributed to their death. Um, and just want to make a, a case study for the males on Finalos Reef. So Hawksbill 56 used to be the most frequently sighted Hawksbill, uh, male Hawksbill on that reef. Uh, it has not been photographed. He's not been seen since October 2012, soon after the resort development started. So he may have moved, but again, we haven't photographed him on any reef, and he was a resident of that reef, which meant he was photographed all year round. Um, so it may have been because of the disturbance, or it may have been because of a territory dispute. So another male showed up, uh, Hawksbill 105, first sighted in April 2012, and he is still seen regularly. So this may mean that the reef is now too small uh, to support two males. They may need more space. In North Male, the number one site by far is Makunudu, <laughs> Makunudu West, almost uh, 90 turtles identified from there with uh, almost 900 sightings. And again, mainly hawksbill turtles, no green turtles identified from this reef. And Boduhiti Reef also supports 30 hawksbill turtles. Um, you can see the sites are, are clustered, of course, around the resort areas around uh, Four Seasons and Lankan Reef, and then near Bodohiti and One and Only Reef. In North Malay, we do see some, some movement. So as I mentioned, usually the turtles are, uh, exhibit very high site fidelity. They stay at their reefs. But if sites are within the same lagoon, we do see them moving maybe one kilometer, two kilometers. So these are the, the sites near uh, Four Seasons and Club Med. And you can see there are even crossing a, the small channel um, north of Club Med. So there is some movement in this area. In Ba Atoll, we see very little movement because the reefs are separated. They're generally not in the same lagoon. In Ari Atoll, um, we've only really started monitoring turtles here with any effort since mid-2013, so it's been about a year. Um, again, the sites are clustered around the resort areas, so there's a number of resorts in south and southeast Ari. Uh, the top site with 28 sightings is uh, the lagoon between uh, Digura all the way down to uh, Ariadu. So the Lux did do Lagoon. Um, we do see movement here, and there's 28 turtles, both hawksbills and green identified here. And a number of the Tilas in this area also support 
uh, between 10 and 20 turtles for that reef. The sighting numbers are lower here, of course, with the reduced um, amount of effort. And in our atoll, we've seen the longest migration or re-sighting uh, for a hawksbill turtle. We had one move from Barufinolotila all the way over to Didu, which is a straight line distance of 12 kilometers. So this is the, the farthest that we've seen a hawksbill turtle move. And as I mentioned, they do move in the Didu Lagoon, uh, which is a distance of 2.5 kilometers. We see them moving back and forth there. So that is, in fact, just one big site and not two or three separate sites. And the furthest uh, migration we've seen, the, a green turtle move, a feeding migration, it was in Baatol between uh, Batala and Finalos, which is a distance of 13.3 kilometers. So they're not like manta rays, which are moving tens of kilometers between different atolls. They like to stay on their home reef. So the benefits, again, of a photo monitoring program are that it's non-invasive. You're not catching or disturbing the animals, which is good for endangered species. It can give you a realistic estimate of population size and distribution, and they are especially good uh, to study male turtles. So normally, number of turtles are determined from nesting females. So the male turtles are very rarely studied in a biological study. So this gives us an opportunity to, to study the movement and the numbers of male turtles. This helps create uh, effective future management uh, strategies. And as I mentioned, it can also involve citizen scientists, so people with no training, people like yourself or people like tourists that come to the Maldives. They can take a photo of a turtle, and you can tell them that turtle's story. If it's been seen before, if it's a new one, then they can have the opportunity to, to give it a name and be part of its story. It, this increases the, the knowledge and the awareness uh, about turtles for both locals and tourists. It allows us to collect a large amount of data over a large area and even from remote data. So the, the team of scientists doesn't actually have to be there. We can have people on the ground uh, taking the photos for it. It makes the guest dive more interesting or snorkel or, or trip. And the protection of turtles is very important for the future of tourism revenue. So many people, many tourists come here to see specific animals. They want to see dolphins. They want to see manta rays. Many of them come to swim with turtles. So they will pay money to go on a trip to swim with live turtles. So it's very important for the future of tourism to keep these turtles alive so that these tourists keep coming to the countries and paying to see these animals. So it's been shown from many places that top-down management, creating laws or creating marine protected areas on paper without the involvement or the support of local communities is a very ineffective way to manage the, the population of an animal. The best way to do it from previous studies is from the bottom up, involving the community and the protection of that animal. This is the most effective approach. And there's a growing number of turtle-based tourism, ecotourism, all around the world, which generate millions of dollars a year for local communities. Um, they involve the, the community members in beach patrols, collecting data on stranding, so turtle deaths, nest protection, which provides steady income for people who perhaps were formerly poaching eggs or poaching turtles. And it gives them a bit of a leadership role in, in the community. People can look up to them. And it's only limited by the number of people who are trained and who are interested in doing this work. So I mentioned that people can only protect what they care about. So spreading awareness, spreading ed education, and the associated appreciation for these animals among locals will increase the number of people who can get involved in this type of conservation. So in summary, uh, the ban on catching and killing sea turtles, the law on paper, will expire next year. But there's still very little known about the population numbers here in the Maldives, if they are increasing or decreasing, which areas need the most protection, uh, which areas are the nesting hotspots. Turtles are keystone species, so they're very important for the ecosystem and also for the tourism industry. People come here to see them and pay money to see them. And additionally, they're a migratory species, so they may must be protected throughout the entire Indian Ocean. 
Uh, all the countries must co cooperate together, and the Maldives has signed its name to an understanding with other Indian Ocean countries that it will protect turtles. And community-based ecotourism is really the most effective management strategy for uh, most endangered species. So involving members of the community and increasing awareness, education, and appreciation among the locals, and they will be able to deliver this information to tourists um, to help create a really effective management strategy for turtles. So I'll leave you with a bit of a quote. Um, and I can take any questions that you have.